and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we'll continue our reading of Cheerfulness Breaks In by Angela Thurkill. Russian, you said, she inquired. You were in Russia, Hein? Mr. Hopkins, wishing more and more that he had never accepted capitalist sherry, said he had been in Moscow, and now he must be getting back. Ha! Getting back to Moscow, doubtless, said Madame Brownskew. She then continued to her husband in French for a bit. Poor Monsieur Brownskew pulled his sheepskin coat so far up his round face that only his large, miserable eyes were visible between the collar and his beret, and shrinking away from Mr. Hopkins, he said in an agonized voice, Che, provka, provka, provka. By this time, all such guests as were left had gathered round in pleasurable excitement, and those that were just going, going, came back and looked over each other's shoulders in the dining room. Mrs. Burkett, who did not at all want her party to finish with a row, came up and begged Madame Brownskew to allow her to buy that delightful piece of embroidery which she had so much admired. But Madame Brownskew paid no attention to her at all. You do not know what he means, she said, addressing Mr. Hopkins, but gathering the whole assembly in her eye. He says, no, never, never, never. Non, jamais, jamais, jamais. And do you know why he says that? It is because the Russians, the Russians have destroyed his piano and his gramophone, all his stallions and mares they have let go. And they, and she continued then on in French for quite some time. And when he sees this dirty type of which I do not know the name, he says, Moscow, this is a torture to him. Gorgo, c'est pour toi, and on to him in, Rush, in French again. Take your embroidery, Mr. Russian, and go back to Moscow. C'est un shilling qui vous mette So saying, she thrust the embroidery into Mr. Hopkins' hands. That unfortunate gentleman, who had little or no acquaintance with French, had not understood what Madame Brownsky was saying, but most of those present had been delightfully shocked and horrified. Among the exceptions was Mrs. Bissell, who told Miss Hampton afterwards that she had given up French as a girl, but she saw that Mr. Hopkins, whom she had never liked, was interfering with the amenities of that nice Mrs. Burkett's party. Give the Russian lady her shilling, Mr. Hopkins, she said in her gentle, authoritative voice. Mr. Hopkins, against his better self, pulled out of his trouser pocket one of those leather purses of rather horseshoe shape, tilted some loose coins into the cover, and held out a shilling. Madame Brownskew took it, threw it contemptuously into the plate of small change, and then, with a sudden effort, snatched the embroidery from its purchaser, tore it in two, and threw it on the floor. She then lighted another cigarette and hummed a national air very loudly. Mrs. Bissell, with the same imperturbable serenity, took Mr. Hopkins by the arm, led him into the hall, said good night to him, and returned to the dining room, where Madame Brownskew was putting the money she had collected into a bag and preparing to go home. Everyone was longing to question her about her appalling experiences at the hands of the Russians, but felt a certain delicacy in beginning. Just as despair was seizing upon all hearts, Octavia Crawley, whose interest in anything to do with hospitals we already know, earned the everlasting gratitude of her mother's friends by adding, asking Madame Brownskew if the cook had got over it. Over which? asked Madame Brownskew. The Russians. I mean, what you said about the way they treated her, said Olivia, suddenly finding it more difficult to talk about the facts of life in her mother's dining room than she did with her VAD friends. Oh, that. And she continued for a while in French. Bien, Gorgo, tu es prêt? But Oct Octavia was of the breed of Bruce's spider and did not know the word defeat. And were you all right? she asked. Yes, I am all right, said Madame Brownskew. But I mean then, the Russians, said Octavia. Octavia, said Mrs. Crawley, much to everyone's annoyance. The Russians? I am not in Lepov then. That was his wife. And she continued again in French, God wills it so. She then swept up the wretched Monsieur Brownskew and took her leave, urging those present to send all their rich friends to buy embroideries. Mrs. Bissell thanked Mrs. Burkett with a, for a most pleasant social gathering and saying how sorry she was for the poor Russian lady having to do all that embroidery, went away with her husband to release Mrs. Dingle from watching over little Edna. The dean then said one must not judge uncharitably of anyone, especially of those who were dependent for their bread on the charity of strangers. With this, to encourage them, the Burkitts and Mrs. Moreland together with the deanery party and Lydia skirted with delicacy round the interesting question, if 
Monsieur Brownskew's wife was not Madame Brownskew. Who was Madame Brownskew? And to this question, they regretfully saw no chance of ever getting an answer. Well, we must be getting home, said Mrs. Crawley, who had decided not to speak to Olivia about her behavior, though chiefly it is to be feared because she did not dare to. Josiah, are you ready? The dean, who often wished that with all due respect to the Bible he had not been called after his grandfather, rallied to his wife and goodbyes were said. Noel repeated his promise to Lydia to come and fetch her from the communal kitchen on the following day. Geraldine, who was on night duty, was to go back with the Crawleys. Mr. Needham, who was driving them, was suddenly struck with the thought of Lydia alone driving herself home through the blackout and asked her earnestly if she would be all right. Lydia, seeing nothing not to be all right about, said of course she would. I have to be over at Northbridge tomorrow about a football match between the Boy Scouts there and our choir school, said Mr. Needham. I was thinking I might perhaps come and see you about tea time if you were in, and your mother is well enough, unless perhaps you were going to be busy or anything. I thought you might perhaps be kind enough to help me about something if it wouldn't be a bother, Lydia said of course. As she drove home, she faintly wished that Mr. Needham, whom she did not in her mind call Tommy, as she had never thought of him since the day they lunched with Mrs. Brandon, weren't coming on the same afternoon as Noel Merton. But if Mr. Needed, Mr. Needham needed helping about something, it was not the way for her to think, so she didn't. Well, if she did, she tucked it away in the back of her mind and gave her parents an amusing account of the sherry party. Mrs. Burkett and Mrs. Moreland agreed at dinner that the party had, on the whole, been a great success. Why did you ask those pestilential gissings, Amy, said Mr. Burkett. If I had any time to dislike people, which heaven knows I haven't just now, with chicken pox bursting out in all the houses, I would dislike those people as much as I have ever disliked anyone. And as for the boy, after all, said Mrs. Burkett, Geraldine has nowhere else to see her friends. Friends, said Mr. Burkett angrily. Rose's friends were bad enough, but Geraldine's are insupportable. I really wish Rose were back sometimes. He looked very tired. Chicken pox and a sherry party and the gissings. Mrs. Moreland could not decide whether his remark was less in favor of Rose or of Geraldine, so for once she held her tongue. Chapter 10, The Path of Duty. On the following day, Lydia Keith, after a single-handed fight with Palmer about tea cloths in which she scored heavily, went off on foot to Northridge Village with a large flowered overall in a bag. As most of the neighborhood was cathedral property and the firm of Keith & Keith had for many years done much of their legal business, Mr. Keith had been able to put gentle spokes in the way of building development and even bully the Barsetshire County Council into building quite presentable houses for the working classes well away from the delightful village street, of which no fewer than 14 different views, including the church, the brick and stone houses of the gentry, and the remaining plaster and thatch houses of the cottages, can be got at any picture postcard shop in Barchester. Next to the Hollies, a pleasant Georgian house standing back behind its shrubbery, was a plain-faced stone house that had been vacant for some time owing to a death and an entangled will. As soon as the threat of evacuee children had become a near menace, the Women's Institute, headed by Mrs. Turner, who lived at the Hollies, and her two nieces, who lived with her, had given an entertainment followed by a whist drive and dance by which they earned enough money to start a communal kitchen. The trustees had consented to use the money of the large kitchen quarters of the excuse me, the trustees had consented to the use of the large kitchen quarters of the empty house, the money from the entertainment had been used to install a new gas cooker and buy a cheap quantity of cheap tables and forms, some very cheap cutlery and various cleaning materials. Volunteers had supplied cooking utensils, dishcloths, crockery and other necessities. The possessors of vegetable gardens and hens had promised weekly supplies according to their means. Mrs. Turner, from her own purse, bought a part share in a pig, whose owner was on the dole and had no intention of coming off it, and supplied a pig bucket on the understanding that the pig's owner would fetch the bucket daily and make over certain portions of the pig to the Women's Institute when it was killed. With a great burst of gladness and relief, nearly all the hostesses of the evacuated boys and girls sent them up to the kitchen, paying threepence a head for an excellent and substantial meal.
It is true that almost in the same breath they said threepence was too much, but Mrs. Turner took no notice at all. Under her truculent despotism, a number of ladies undertook to do the cooking, the serving, and the washing up in rotation. And it must be said to the credit of Northbridge that very few had defaulted. What with her mother and the house and the Red Cross and the estate and working parties, Lydia had not much time to spare. But she helped to serve the lunches one day a week and, as we have seen, did not allow anything to interfere with it. The church clock was striking twelve as Lydia went into the house by the side door and down a long stone-flagged passage to what were called by the estate agent the commodious offices. Here Mrs. Turner was hard at work superintending the preparation of great saucepans of rabbit stew and potatoes. She had been at the kitchen since ten o'clock that morning and would be there till the last helper had gone, and this she did every day except Saturdays and Sundays. By her instructions, the gas cooker had been installed in the scullery so that the washing up could go on under her eye. The kitchen itself, with its wasteful range and huge dresser, was not used, and the servants' hall had been turned into a dining room. In it, Mrs. Turner's nieces were laying a knife and fork and a spoon and fork and a china cup fifty times over on the bare deal tables. Lydia put on her overall and, seizing two large tin loaves, cut them up into small chunks, two plates of which she put on each table. She then filled a large jug with water and poured some into each cup, repeating these actions till all the cups were half full, for if they were any fuller, the children always slopped them at once. That's right, said Mrs. Turner, as she prodded a large saucepan of potatoes to see if they were done. How's your mother, Lydia? Pretty all right, said Lydia. What's the pudding? Stewed pears and synthetic custard and plain cake baked in meat pans, said Mrs. Turner. Where's my colander, Betty? Actually, said Betty, who was Mrs. Turner's elder niece, it's on the hook. I'll get it. Mrs. Turner took the colander and began turning out her potatoes, of which a dozen large dishes were put on the long tables near the door of the servants' hall, together with piles of plates. At the same moment, the younger niece opened the door into the stable yard, and fifty children, rushing, clumping into their dining room, formed up in a rough, pushing, gabbling queue. The well-known smell of children and stew filled the air, and Lydia wished for a moment that everyone was dead. The other helpers, who, though extremely good and conscientious, are too dull to mention, lifted great fish kettles of stew from the stove onto the serving tables, and the ritual began. Who's doing the veg? asked Lydia, getting behind the table. Well, actually, it's me, said Betty, but you can if you like. I'll do the rabbit. I hope they didn't leave any eyes in. Betty stationed herself behind a kettle of rabbit, and with an iron ladle half filled a plate with a luscious stew. To this, Lydia added potatoes and handed the plate to the child at the head of the queue. The other helpers served in the same way, and each child carried its plate to its own seat. No sooner were they all served than a dozen or more came back carrying their plates with expressions of fastidiousness and insolence that Lydia tried hard not to see. Miss, I don't like rabbit. Miss, there's something nasty on my plate. Dory says it's kidneys. Miss, the lady didn't give me any gravy. Miss, Grace has got a bigger bit than me. Miss, my mother wrote me not to touch rabbit. Miss, can't I have some more rabbit? I don't like potatoes. Miss, Jimmy Barker took three bits of bread and I ain't got none. Miss, I don't like rabbit. I want fish and chips. Gradually, the plaints subsided. Lydia went round the dining room with the jug of water replenishing mugs. Already the tables were slopped with water, gravy, rabbit bones, and splashings of potato. The smell of children and stew became thicker. The children themselves looked remarkably healthy and were well and warmly dressed. Lydia recognized some of the arted-up frocks from her working party and a couple of boys' jerseys that had belonged to her brother Robert's little boy Henry. The children filed back with their plates, which the helpers rapidly emptied into the pig bucket. What with those who didn't like rabbit, and those who didn't like potatoes, and those who didn't like gravy, and those who had taken three pieces of bread and only messed it about, and those who had eaten so many sweets already, bought with postal orders sent them by their starving parents, that they could not eat at all, the bucket did pretty well. The helpers now stationed themselves behind the serving table and dealt out stewed pears and custard with a strip of cake to each. 
A number of children raised plaintive cries for or against these different articles of food, but the plaints, owing to fullness, were less violent. As soon as they had finished, they rushed shrieking into the stable yard and so out into the street, and quiet fell. Mrs. Turner and her aides took off the stove, the kettles and saucepans of water that had been boiling and did the wash up. The lay helpers, by which we mean the dull and nameless ones, then said they were sorry they must go home as their husbands didn't like it if they were late. Mrs. Turner, Lydia, Betty, and the other niece washed the tables, swept the floor, and washed out all the drying cloths, which the other niece hung up in the yard to dry, after which they sat down and made their own lunch off some stew and potatoes that Mrs. Turner had kept back. I wish it was summer and we were having a picnic at the wishing well, said Betty suddenly. Actually, we couldn't because they've got an anti-aircraft post up there, but I wish we could. If those kinds of things really happened, like what people write about, about everything really happening at the same time, only nobody knows exactly what it is, said the younger niece, we could, but I think that's all rot. A pensive silence fell in which the four helpers thought about time. I wonder, said Mrs. Turner, how long it will take to get this place clean again when we stop, if we ever do. It took us days at home, said Lydia, and that was only six children and coats of whitewash. Why they all smell so much, I can't think, said Mrs. Turner. They all get one bath a week, and most of them get two, and we've dressed them from top to toe and from the inside to the outside. Peculiar. I suppose the whole of the Middle Ages smelt like that. Come along, girls, we'll just wash up our own dishes, and then we're done. Actually, said Betty, we ought to be at the ARP practice now. Lydia said they had better go, and she would wash up with Mrs. Turner. She was then hanging up the saucepan lid on its nail when Noel Merton walked in, announcing that he had tracked her by the smell of rabbit stew from as far off as the post office. It's filthy, said Mrs. Turner with great frankness, but the children smell much worse, bless them. I believe the whole of England will smell of children in stew before we're done. Goodbye, I've got a Polish relief working party at two. She turned the gas off at the meter and went away. Lydia sat down on a wooden chair while she folded her overall. For a moment, her hands lay slack on the flowered bundle and she looked down. Then she raised her head and looked at Noel. You've done it again, Noel, she said. I knew there was something wrong with you the minute you came into the kitchen. It wasn't my fault, said Noel apologetically. Being of a crabbed and studious disposition, I did rather well in my exams and they made me a captain. I now have a bloodlust and would like to be a major. One crown is an agreeable badge. I suppose promotion means going abroad somewhere, said Lydia. Not yet, so far as I know, said Noel, but you shall be the very first person to know if I do. Oath of a captain. Lydia got up and shook herself with her usual vigor. I feel I'd never get this rabbit evacuee smell off me, she said vehemently. Come on. She led the way down the flagged passage to where Noel's car was standing by the curb and got in. Noel went round and got in on the other side. Look here, my girl, he said. Do you know what you did just now? You sat still with your hands in front of you. I've never seen you do that before. Is your mother worse? Not really, said Lydia, only up and down. Luckily, we've got loads of coal because she can't stand the cold. I'm thinking of shutting up the drawing room and using the library. Father and I do the estate work there, but that won't worry mother. Sometimes, Noel, one gets a bit down if you know the feeling. Noel said he did, and in his experience it always came right again, and where would Lydia like to go for a drive, as he had vast stores of petrol? Do you know it's the most extraordinary thing, said Lydia, but I actually, oh, oh bother that word, I didn't mean to say it, but Mrs. Turner's niece says it all the time, and I suppose I caught it from her. I mean, as a matter of fact, I don't feel much like driving. You wouldn't care to come for a walk down to the water meadows, would you? Noel said it was what he would like of all things, and turned his car toward Northbridge Manor. When they got there, Lydia said she would just hurl her overall into the house and wash some of the rabbit off her if Noel would wait. So he went out on the little flagged terrace behind the house and sat on a white seat. Against this southern wall, one could still bask in a mild way. The trees were dripping their golden autumn coats onto the grass, and everything breathed an undisturbed peace. Noel thought of how many pleasant visits he had paid to the hospitable Keiths, beginning with the night he had spent there unexpectedly four or five years ago, when Mr. Keith had made him miss a train. 
He smiled as he remembered the large, awkward, violent, good-humoredly untidy schoolgirl that Lydia was then. Looking back on their early acquaintance, he came to the conclusion that if he had not stood up to Lydia at once, she would have knocked him down and trampled on him morally in her stride. By the greatest good fortune, he had stood up to her bludgeoning, and so earned her favor, and a highly unsentimental comradeship had sprung up between them. While Noel became more and more successful at the bar and was increasingly in demand among hostesses, he could always rely on Lydia to look him piercingly through and with her, uh, uh, and with her alarmingly honest eyes take him down a peg whenever she felt it necessary. In his mind, he compared the Lydia he had known first with the Lydia he knew today and found very little change except for the good. True, she did not appear at river picnics any longer in a shapeless garment with her bright red face, neck, arms, and legs sticking out of it, but her mind still moved with a good deal of the brusqueness of those days, and she was almost as ready to lay down the law as when she had preached about Horace and Shakespeare and Browning at sixteen. Now, for the first time, he was conscious that his ridiculous Lydia was in earnest. Only by chance references had he gathered from her all she was doing, but her father had spoken about her, and so had the Crawleys, and his admiration for her had grown. With her sister Kate away at Southbridge, busy with her own children and the duties of a housemaster's wife, and her special brother Colin in the army, Lydia had constituted herself the guardian of her father and her ailing mother, a lonely life when all her friends were enjoying themselves with hospitals and ambulances. Noel reflected upon his own job, an uprooting, it is true, but in interesting places and among interesting people, and wondered idly if he could have done what Lydia was doing, a question that he didn't like to press too far. And now, also, he was conscious for the first time that his vital, tireless Lydia could feel fatigue or strain. When he came down the long, flagged passage into the communal kitchen and saw her hanging up a saucepan lid, he had seen her as he always saw her, doing something. But when she sat so still for a moment, her hands idle on the folded overall in her lap, he had seen what he had never seen before, a Lydia putting down her burden before she shouldered it again. The remembrance pierced him. Then Lydia came out, announcing that if they were going down the water meadow, they might as well tidy the boathouse, a fact which she evidently considered sufficient explanation for the very shapeless gray flannel skirt and untidy short-sleeved jumper she was wearing. Noel suddenly saw his old Lydia again and got up to accompany her. They walked down the lawn and through the little gate into the meadows, which had already been flooded once, and gleamed grayly where the waters had remained standing. The winding course of the river was marked by a fringe of alders, willows, and mountain ashes, now almost leafless, while above it rose the line of the downs with the beech clump showing its tracery against the sky. I do like this, said Lydia, making a vigorous sweep with her right arm that Noel with difficulty avoided. She said no more till they got to the boathouse. Here she made Noel take off his tunic, though the old Lydia would not have stood over him while he folded it neatly and hung it over a fence and for nearly an hour they worked hard. The boat and the canoe had to be emptied of the leaves that had blown in from the river bank. The oars were put into their winter quarters on the wall. The cushions and mats were heaped on a bench outside of one of the gardeners to bring up to the house. Lydia, with solemnity, closed and locked the river doors. Then, after taking a last look at the green gloom behind her, she locked the outer door. End of the boating season, she announced. Colin usually does the grand closing with me, but last time he wrote, he said he couldn't be sure when he would get leave, so we'd better do it. Noel put his tunic on again, and again they walked up the, to the house. There was a great deal he wanted to say to her, but he couldn't find the words or the occasion. To praise her would probably only earn her good-humored scorn. To tell her that he was anxious for her with all her burdens might annoy her. To try to explain what had pierced him in her momentary lassitude might trouble her mind. So he left everything unsaid and discussed the question of buying more pigs for the farm, or rather listened to Lydia's monologue on the subject. And we'll hear more from Lydia next time.